What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsec. I'm doing Bagel from Hack the Box, which is a Linux box, but also features .NET. It's pretty cool now that .NET Core runs on Linux. The first step of the box though is just a standard Python Flask web server that features a file disclosure vulnerability. You can leak its source code to reveal it talks to the .NET application over port 5000. You can also abuse that same file disclosure to brute force PIDs in the slash proc directory and see all the running processes of the box, or at least the processes you have access to. And one of those CMD lines that you can see leaks where the DLL for the .NET web server is. So you use the file disclosure, download the DLL, do some light reversing, discover there's a deserialization vulnerability in the uh, .NET web server that leads to you extracting a SSH key. And then the privesc of the box is sudo with .NET. You can use that with FSI. It's called the F sharp interactive mode. And they can just execute commands right on it as root. So with that being said, let's just jump in. As always, we start off with an nmap. So dash sc for default scripts, sv enumerate versions, oa output all formats, put in the nmap directory and call it bagel. Then the IP address of 10.10.11.201. This can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the result, we have just three ports open. The first one is SSH on port 22, and its banner tells us it's an open SSH server. We also have port 5000 that is open, and based upon these headers, it looks like it is a web server, and we see Microsoft NetCore 2.0. So you may think this is a Windows box, but we can validate that by using the TTL. So if I do a ping 10.10.11.201, we see the TTL is set to 63. The default TTL on Linux is 64, so it decrements by one, and you get 63, so we know this is Linux. If it was Windows, the default TTL there is 128. Document that by 1, 127. So if we saw 127, that would be Windows. Uh, 63 would be Linux. It is odd that it is running .NET on Linux, but that is possible nowadays. So we also have port 8000 that is open. It's running WorkZug, and that's Python 3.10. And looking deeper into this, we can see it is redirecting us to bagel.htb with page is equal to index.html. So this looks like a um, textbook file disclosure vulnerability, right? So let's add this to a host file. So sudo vi etsy host, then 10, 10, 11, 201. We can do bagel.htb. And then let's just go there. So bagel.htb, we can try port 5000 first and we just get a white page. So let's try port 8000. And we have, welcome to the bagel shop. And scrolling down, we can see it just looks like a shop. I don't see any way to order anything. And these bagels, I'm hoping this is like a dozen or two because 2250 for a sweet bagel, that is one expensive bagel. Um, so there is a slash orders page. If we go there, it looks like it just leaks all their clients. So this would be a vulnerability right off the bat. Uh, because we can see P Morgan bought 20 chocolate bagels in his address. Like this is just a horrible online shop, but I don't know exactly what to do with orders. We could probably go buster this and try to find other endpoints. But whenever I see page is equal to something, I always test for file disclosure, right? And I'm saying file disclosure purposefully because it's technically not an LFI unless it actually executes code. The inclusion part of LFI comes from like PHP include statements where um, it executes code, right? So since this is Python, I'm gonna guess it's just going to be file disclosure technically. But most people call it LFI because you include a local file, but um, semantics, right? So we're in the repeater tab. We can look at this. Um, it's just giving us a not modified. We do have some caching headers. So if I remove these, um, it tells us, it just gives us the page, right? And then we also get um, the headers so we could do caching if we want to. But when we're testing, we generally want to get rid of the cache. So the first thing I want to test for is um, LFI, right? Or file disclosure. And we'll test for both file and director, uh, file disclosure with directory traversal by putting a bunch of dot dot slashes. And we can see we get the Etsy passwd file. Now, the very first thing I generally check is like proc self CMD line. And we can see uh, where we're running out of. So we're running out of home developer app app.py. So let's try um, 
including this. So we'll do home developer app app.py. And we can get the application source. Um, burp is not showing us the um, spaces that start on a line. So if we wanted to, we could just copy this and then do curl bagel.htb, paste it in. Uh, we need to specify port 8000 and then dash o app.py to save it there. So we got the web source. We can also test for like SSH keys. So we can do dot SSH, um, ID RSA. We get file not found. One of the things I always like testing for when we um, have some type of file disclosure is if it can enumerate a valid directory. We know home developer does exist. We try accessing it, we get file not found. Uh, we put something that doesn't exist. I assume this directory doesn't, we get the same thing. So we can't validate if directories exist, unfortunately. Um, we could do like proc self environ and get all the environment variables to see if there's maybe like some type of secret key, but it doesn't look like there is. Um, if for some reason we couldn't access this proc directory, um, like Python applications are probably gonna be named like app.py or server.py. So we could do pages equal to app.py, we don't get it, dot, dot, slash, and then we do get it. So um, two different ways to get it. Obviously, knowing the file name is much quicker, but if you go the long route of enumerating proc self, you will almost always be able to find the Python source code. So let's go take a look at it. So let's open up in Vim and we can look at the source. So the default route, the just slash page or index page, it's going to check if page is in request.arguments. If it's not, it's going to send a redirect. If it is, then we're going to build the path. So static slash the argument. So this is why we need to do dot dot slash app.py because it's putting static in front of it. And then we check if it's a file and send the file back to the user. So nothing too interesting there. We've already discovered the file disclosure. Then we have this orders. And there is a comment here saying, don't forget to run the order app first with .NET path to DLL command. Use your SSH key to access the machine. So um, this is definitely gonna be port 5000. We already know that's running .NET. And then it's just doing a WebSocket connection. So it's not really a web server, it's a WebSocket server, right? And then it's sending read order orders.txt and there's outputting the data. So let's test this out. Um, let's connect through WebSockets. And I'm gonna use a tool called WSCAT. If you don't have it, you can do a sudo npm install dash g WSCAT to get it. But with it, it will just let us connect to a WebSocket and send text, right? So I'm gonna do WSCAT and then uh, dash c to connect. And we'll do WS 10, 10, 11, 201, port 5000. And it says it's connected. So I'm going to grep read order out of app.py. I'm gonna send it this string. And I think I know what we're gonna get back because we saw the slash orders page, right? And if we do this, um, we do get unauthorized, but it does output a list of all the orders. So um, we can access this, right? I'm not gonna to play too much in the read order because we already found a file disclosure vulnerability. I guess this could be running as a different user. But my main thing is um, around the comment of the DLL, right? If we look at it, we want to know exactly where this DLL is because if we find it, we can extract the source code to this and then um, analyze the application that's running, right? And if we go back to the file disclosure, we can easily do something, right? So. If we do proc self CMD line, this is just getting our own PID, right? But if we specify the PID, we can see the running process. There's also maybe um, sked underscore debug. Will this show us? Let's see, what is that? LS proc grep. So I guess that's just not there. Um, Sometimes you can get running processes from this file. But if we just brute force all these PIDs, we may be able to get um, where the DLL is, right? So let's run a quick script to do this. So I'm going to copy this 
and I'm gonna do four I N. Then we can do sequence zero to a hundred. Uh, let's do a thousand. And then we'll say do echo I. And we'll do dash N. I probably should put this in a script. Um, dump process.sh. There we go. This will be easier for you to read. Sec zero, a thousand, do, and then we'll do echo dash n. So the dash n is just saying don't put a line break there. And now we can do curl bagel.htb port 8000 page is equal to this. I want to do i.cmd line. And then done. What happens when we run this? Uh, we probably want this dash dash output to say um, standard out. So let's see. Um, if I do curl bagel htb 8000, we can just grab this one so I can show exactly what happened there. Page is equal. Um, we do dash O this because for some reason curl thinks this is a binary file and it doesn't want to output it. So we do dash O dash to force it to. Um, the other thing is it's not putting a line break for us. So we're going to put a echo command afterwards. So we have this dash O dash and I'm going to just give it a blank echo. Then we can run dump process and we're getting everything. I'm going to use T just so we have it outputting. I was hoping to output to a log. Uh, let's see, is it dash Q to hide that for quiet? Let's see, man curl. Is there a silent dash S? There we go. So it's going to write everything to process.log just so we have a record of it. And I'm going to um, pause the video and we're going to resume when this is all dumped. So we have an output of the first 1000 PIDs and that should be in the file uh, process.log. So I'm just going to grep for anything that be or has a slash because I don't want to see these file not founds and also um, if we didn't have permission to it, it just displayed nothing, right? So uh, maybe grep dash A, there we go. So now we can see a list of everything we want. And we see .NET is running out of opt bagel bin debug net 6.0 bagel.dll. So let's copy this and try to download it, right? So we can curl bagel.htb port 8000 page is equal to bunch of dot slashes and then this path. Fix that. We'll call it bagel.dll and we have it. And if we look at it, we can see it's a .NET assembly. So I'm going to copy it over to my Windows box and we're going to run dnspy against it to decompile it. So over on Windows, Open up dnspy. We can do file open, go to desktop, bagel dll. And we have the source code. Uh, let's see, we want to go expand bagel server. So in the bagel server, we have main. It's going to initialize it and then do an infinite loop, just sleeping for a second. And the whole reason it does this is just so it doesn't peg a processor whenever you want to just wait forever. Uh, just don't do a blank loop, make sure there's a sleep involved so that way you don't spike the CPU to 100%. Um, we initialize it, we start it, and then here's message received. And we're going to get a string and then deserialize it and then send it back. So let's look at what the deserialization function looks like. 
and we see it's doing JSON convert dot DCLIs object, and it's taking the base object, and we got type name handling four. So we should figure out what this is. So I'm going to grab um, type name handling so it's on my clipboard, and then I'm going to go up to the top, and we're gonna see it's using the Newton Soft JSON library. So let's ask ChatGBT exactly what this is. So I'm gonna say, um, what is type name handling equals four and dot nets Newton soft JSON library. And it's going to say four refers to value objects. And I wanna say the one thing I don't like about using ChatGPT is we always get different things. The last time I asked it, it was said four was set to auto. So um, it's not always going to lead to the correct answer, right? Um, let's see. I wonder if I just search type name handling and we um, do it the old fashioned way of research. Type name handling, Newton soft. Uh, we probably should take burp suite off. Type name handling, Newton soft. So let's see, creates an object. So essentially um, what we have, I'm gonna try just explaining this. Uh, this piece will be helpful later. Um, but the type name handling is gonna be um, how it can be serialized or what can be serialized. And when it's set to four, it's either all or automatic. I wanna say it's automatic, which means it's going to auto discover um, what the setting is. So this enables us essentially to um, make it an object. And when we make it an object, we can uh, find those gadgets and create our own types of functions, right? So this is the dangerous setting of type name handling. It wants, it probably should be like one or two, just so you can't deserialize objects. And since it's gonna be the base object, we can click here and see what it is. So it's going to be um, orders. So we only have access to um, orders it looks like. And the object's going to include a user ID, a session, a time. And then in the orders um, class, we probably have remove order, write order, and read order. And Read order is what we did before to get order.txt, right? Um, and this is a string, this is a string, but remove order is an object. So um, since it's an object, when we deserialize this, we can make it call other things within this um, application. So if we go over to the file handler, we have read file, so we can make a remove order object become read file and then read any file we want. Uh, we also got read content. Um, let's see, I think there's a set file as well, write file. So we could also write files to the disk. And by default, it's gonna be opt bagel orders, orders.txt, but again, um, we're able to change this. There's also a DB class and in DB, it does leak credentials. So we got dev with this password. If we tried spraying this password, nothing works. Um, the hint in the Python code does say you should um, attempt to uh, use um, SSH keys for login, right? If we go back to app.py, use your SSH key to access this machine. So I'm guessing the um, user that is running this .NET app is different and we're able to um, read their SSH key, right? So what users are on this box first? If we go back to Burp Suite and let's do Etsy Pass WD. We could try fill and developer. Um, we already tried developer from this. We could also try home, fill, SSH, ID, RSA, and we can't get it from this. 
but maybe the .NET application is running as fill and we can leak the source code. So we want to make an object and this type thing in here is definitely key. So this is how we specify the object. So it goes um, type is, let's see, going to be bagel server. And then the um, file. So let's do, I'm going to make this in a text file. So first we do remove order and then we create our um, object, right? So I want to say type and then we want, I wonder if, I think I just do, how is this done? And it's in quotes. So we do bagel server dot file because this is what we want to read. And then this piece is gonna be the assembly name. And the assembly name here is going to be um, bagel. So in our object, we can specify bagel. So the next piece we want is going to be uh, read file. And then we want um, probably file name. So let's do read file and then the file name of Etsy pass WD and then close out the JSON object. We can cat it, pipe the JQ to make sure we wrote a uh, valid JSON and let's just send this over. So let's do WS cat again ws cat dash c websocket 10 10 14 8 not 10 48 10 10 11 201 port 5000 and i need a period there send this and we get order not found so let's go back over to the source code and let's see read file um it's reading this directory this file name and we're right here at read content. And we caught the exception because we said order not found. If we scroll all the way down, we see directory is set to op bagel orders and the file name is orders.txt. So let's do directory traversal again and we'll do three dot dot slashes to get out of opt bagel orders. So we can do dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot like this. And now we have successfully read this file. So let's now go read SSH keys again. So we can do home uh, developer SSH ID RSA order not found. The other user was Phil and we get an SSH key. So let's grab this and I'm going to do print F because printf is going to obey these um, backslash ends, or I thought it would. If we do printf, uh, I don't know why they did not work. That's just v, uh, we'll call this fill.idrsa, paste it in, percent s, replace line break with backslash r backslash n. That did not work. Let's try this again. Replace line break with line break. Backslash r, there we go. That looks better. So with chmod 600, fill idrsa, SSH dash I fill ID RSA and fill at 10, 10, 11, 201. Yes. And we get logged into bagel and there is user dot text right there. Uh, if we go in this dot net directory, nothing really too interesting. 
We do sudo dash L. We need the password for fill. Um, we go back to the source code. There was this database, right? And we saw user ID dev and a password of this K8, right? So let's grab this, paste it in. And it did not work. So I'm going to control C, make sure it was on my clipboard correctly. It is. And let's try um, other users for this password. Etsy, passwd, we'll grep everything that ends in sh. There is a developer user. This password was for dev, so maybe this is that user's password, and we can log into developer. And that's where the Python web server is, right? So let's do a sudo dash L, and we can see developer is able to run .NET. So we can pretty much run any .NET um, application. If I do GTFO bins, we do a search. Let's look at .NET. We can see there is a sudo. And if we do um, FSI, system diagnostic process start bin sh, it looks like it will allow us to run a shell. So I'm going to copy that. We'll do sudo user bin.net, enter, do ls, let's see, quit, control D, there we go. It put this on two lines, so let's make sure this goes on one line. Put this in a single quote. Let's see, unable to find this. That did not work. Wait, I think it told me it can't find a file, right? It didn't try to run the command. Unable to find the file system diagnostic. So it's expecting this to be a file name and not a um, command. I bet if I just ran it here in this terminal where it looks like it's running .NET code, there we go. So if I do ID now, we can see we are root. Um, I guess SE Linux is also enabled because we have this context. But if I do CD slash root, we can get root.txt. If we go CD bagel, I guess that's the .NET binary. I don't know what bagel is. Uh, a Linux executable, elf. So if we exit this, I just want to test this out real quick. I wonder if I put this as a file. I'm going to v dev shm test.cs, put this, and let's do dev shm test.cs. Uh, it wants fs, fsi, okay. We'll do fsi extension. I'm not exactly sure what this mode is. We know how to abuse it, but we don't know what FSI is. Um, start F sharp interactive or execute F sharp scripts. So we're not doing um, the typical .NET. This is F sharp, I guess. And I'm guessing there's some magic bytes that we want for an FSI file. Um, because if we run this, what it say? Unexpected identifier and signature file. Yeah. So we're just in um, an interactive mode where you can run F sharp commands. So that's where the thing came from. So hopefully that somewhat makes sense, but that's going to be the video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Take care and I'll see you all next time.